So welcome to this um, import export knowledge sharing session, uh, also known as Joe Ones. This is the second one we do at the uh, Manus team. Um, James Lopez uh, working the uh, Manus team at GitLab. Um, this uh, session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Um, also, uh, these are not proper slides, but I wrote a Markdown document because the um, the purpose uh, for this knowledge sharing session is mainly um, to act like a, at a point for the um, rest of the engineering team to um, know more about the code, uh, but also with some um, uh, some general knowledge uh, sharing as well. Um, so we'll um, create a method request to get this to the uh, CE repo in the import export um, namespace to have like a readme there. Um, yeah, the link to the slides is uh, in the, um, yeah, that one. And also in the um, minus issue, uh, there's a link in the um, calendar. Basically, um, so this is probably the prettiest slide that we're going to have. <laughs> Next one. So what we cover is I will do a quick demo on what the import export is. Um, then we look at the known issues and uh, problems uh, with an emphasis on performance, which uh, we have more um, more problems recently. Um, to do with that. Then we talk about the uh, security, um, then the uh, versioning, and probably uh, the most awaiting uh, question, which is when do we have to bump the, uh, the version? And then we look a bit uh, at the code, and we have some time for, a lot of time, hopefully, for some questions. But feel free to interrupt me anytime as well. Um, so I have this project here. So the import export basically means that we can export an archive of data uh, for a project at GitLab. Um, in, in this case, uh, if we want to export this project, we have to go to the um, general settings and then export project. And there's a few things that get exported, such as the project configuration wiki, the repository uploads, um, and all the um, issues, comments, mail requests, tips, um, labels, um, the LFS objects, and many other entities as well. Because uh, we keep we keep adding entities to to projects, so a lot of them. Um, and in every release, we, we keep adding things uh, to this. Uh, there's a few things that we don't export, like the traces, artifacts, um, and some some variables, um, encrypted tokens, and yeah, anything anything that is encrypted, we we don't normally um, export it. Um, so if we click on export project, it should be pretty fast because it's a small project anyway. And we refresh the page. There's also a notification that um, gets sent to the email of the user that um, schedules this. Um, it needs to be maintained, by the way, in order to um, export uh, any project. Um, then you can click on download export, which is ready now. Um, we have the archive. Um, now, we can uh, move this window. Go to create a new project and choose the um, the export book that we just um, downloaded. Um, there's a few options here. The top, the first one is the GitLab export. There's also a similar one which um, people sometimes they don't know about, which is the GitLab.com import, and is slightly similar. Um, the difference is that the export, uh, as I mentioned before, it 
it does um, export quite a few things related to the project, while the GitLab.com, it uses um, authentication. So you need to configure um, the GitLab.com integration uh, through OAuth and and then you'll be able to import, I think, many issues, not, not many things at all. So uh, people don't normally use this option that much and just go for the uh, for the extra one. Um, question, we avoid exporting CIs in the past for security reasons. Yes, mainly for security reasons. And also um, there's another reason for that. And it's because it's not easy to export these uh, variables. We, we have, when we, most of these, um, these tokens and everything, they're encrypted, which means that we use um, this DB encryption key that is sort of unique per instance. And normally this is used, although I'm doing the input in the same instance um, right now, normally this is used for moving uh, these projects between instances, like exporting from GitLab.com to a local instance, or the other way around. A lot of people are migrating uh, from uh, self-hosting to GitLab.com and they will export from the local instance and into GitLab.com. That has a different DB um, encryption key. Uh, so those uh, variables, those columns that um, are encrypted, they, they, won't, uh, they won't work properly uh, because the key is different. So uh, there's an issue about this somewhere. I think it has to do this come, comes up very often with the backup um, restore, um, uh, backup restore um, uh, um, thing, because then people are more inter interested in, in exporting these things, while in the import export is not something that you can normally ask about. Um, so a workaround for that could be asking for the DB key at some point or something like that. But um, yeah, that's one of the reasons. The other is obviously uh, security as well. Um, so. Let me just grab the this one we just downloaded and uh, to fill this import test. Uh, very simple uh, demo, by the way. So now it's in progress. Uh, we'll get more into what's happening behind the scenes a bit later. But, um, um, okay, you can see it's a copy of the um, the other small project. It's basically it's got the repo and one issue, one message request. Um, and everything should, should be there and um, going some of the configuration. Um, recently started encrypting webhooks. Um, I guess we export those and encrypt it. Um, mm -mm -mm. I'm not sure actually, but I can check. Um, I think I think there's an issue somewhere actually. Um, yeah, so webhooks, I think they were added by accident. Let me check, quickly check this, because anyway, it's sort of related to what we import and we don't. Um, yeah, maybe those, but uh, yeah, uh, this was added by mistake. Um, so there's an issue somewhere um, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't export this. And this is basically ignored by the import. and. And probably by the export because we have a um, attribute cleaner or something like that. It will probably remove these things. Uh, we get to this class a bit later anyway. So um, yeah, but this was added by mistake. We do export this, but um, they they probably don't don't contain anything. Um, they're not very useful. They should probably be removed uh, because of the issue I mentioned earlier anyway. Um, so. That's it from the demo. Um, there's also a bunch of things that I won't cover today because the import expert is used in quite a few places such as the instant level templates. Then we also have the project level and soon the group level. I think it's gonna, I don't know if it's been merged already, uh, but um, all of these templates, um, they are using the um, import expert behind the scenes as well. Uh, there's also the API for the import export uh, which provides a few extras like overrides for the uh, project, um, some project columns and configuration. And there's also something like a hook that we have 
after we um, export a project and we can pass a URL to the API saying, hey, after you export this project, then upload the export archive to um, a server, say S3 um, or whatever. Um, so those things, I won't cover them today because it's, it's quite a lot going on there. Um, but um, so that you're aware that all of these, they use the import export. Um, the next point is um, specific to debugging and uh, what to do when uh, we found a problem. Um, so the, I mean, the, the normally you get instant feedback in here instead of uh, the pre was actually imported, there should be an, an error there that states, hey, something happened, um, which also reflects um, this import error that we can check from the console. Um, so if something happens, we will probably get notified there. Um, uh, sometimes it's not as simple, so we can we can check what's going on. Um, and there's a few things that we can do in order to uh, debug any any errors. I think the the key columns to check are these three: the job ID, uh, which comes from Sidekick. Uh, this is a this is gets uh, scheduled as a background job, and Sidekick return, returns this um, this job ID, and we keep it in the database because it's quite useful to uh, to have so we can uh, quit for it later. Um, import status, this is uh, significant as well. Um, we talk about why a bit later um, and the import error, which should be reflecting the eyes I mentioned earlier. Then there's the logs. Um, this hasn't been transitioned to uh, structure logs yet, but hopefully soon. So. Uh, a bit annoying to grab, uh, but this one thing that we always do. So if there's any error, we always log uh, in um, a statement that starts with import export error, so we can grab for that. And there's also backtrace. Uh, then the job ID, uh, we can grab also in the um, sidekick logs for it. Um, and uh, in the next slide, we we'll dig a bit more about uh, why that is useful. Um, so Tiago says those columns were migrated to another model called blah blah blah, which is associated to project by project ID. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think uh, I don't know if it's called project status or something like that. But I think this works still. Um, I think all of these columns um, may have a method that basically calls this other model anyway. Uh, you want in a new version? Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, cool, but I think we, um, yeah, we can just uh, call the new model anyway, project blah, 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 dot. Um, and I can find out quickly, maybe. Yeah, import, maybe Tiago knows, import status or something, state. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, so, Yeah, we do have a structure of sidekick logs on gitlog.com, which makes it harder to, be, to debug now, because I think we removed the other ones maybe, um, but I haven't checked that. Um, we should move to structure logging version. Uh, and this is quite easy uh, with the input, with the import export, because this um, there's a single place that we call the errors and everything, just like the share class uh, is called when there's any error. Um, anyway, moving on. Next, um, so I made it a section because performance is probably uh, one of the most um, recurrent problems lately uh, with the import export. Um, we have two kind of issues that uh, are quite recurrent. One is the, uh, and this is common to other sidekey jobs anyway, and other imports, uh, but it occurs conflictingly uh, with the import export, which is the out of memory errors uh, related to the sidekick memory killer. So this, this um, sidekick um, class, um, it, it's probably in most, if, you know, if not all of the sidekick jobs, and 
basically when we reach um, maximum uh, resident memory of two gigs, I think that's the setting kilo.com right now, it will send a, a kill signal, I don't know which one, to Sidekick, and uh, then Sidekick will um, sort of end the process after, I think, 15 minutes or something like that, uh, with a hard kill signal. Um, and this happens when any job goes over that limit. Um, so this doesn't happen often unless the job is um, is using a lot of memory, which could happen when we export like or import a big repository. Um, so how do we know that the job got killed? We have um, uh, we have. Uh, this is not as easy as before because we have the import status that will remain as it started. Um, so after a while, we'll notice that it didn't finish, and we see no errors. And also, you can check that the um, the job is no longer is no longer there in Sidekick. Um, the best thing to check this is with the uh, Sidekick logs, and this is why this job ID was important because then we will see something like this, Wox is still in progress, blah, blah, blah. And this is probably the first kill signal that we sent. And in here, you will see a struct with a list of job IDs. And one of them will be um, the one that we, um, that related to the import export. Um, this is a bit hard to debug because the, we couldn't we couldn't grab for the kill signal because it will kill the process and it may get a random job ID and not necessarily this one. Um, basically, when we schedule a say sidekick worker for doing the import job, uh, this will be picked by a process that has different threads. Each thread will have a job ID. Um, if each thread will do different uh, different kind of uh, jobs. One will be the import. Um, so when we kill, we kill the process, which means that other things will get killed as well. Um, um, the workaround for this is easier in if we are self-hosted, because then we can just increase this memory um, threshold. Uh, more about that in this um, this document there. Um, there's also another thing that may happen, and is that if um, if it doesn't get killed by the uh, memory killer, but the, the export is really big, it may get killed by the um, import jobs worker, which basically marks an import as failed after a while. Um, I think we have these 15 hours um, default. So. In the logs, we'll see something like this. Again, the job ID, we can grab for that, and we'll see that this is what happened. And in this case, we do mark it as fails, which means that we will see the error in the, um, um, in the import error column, basically. Um, John asked, would it be possible to predict the size of a product export before we do it? Um, most of the times, we can. Because unfortunately, I don't know if this is the next one. No, but anyways, um, when we export a job, we we don't match this. We just call um, to JSON and all the project models, and this is done in one go, uh, which means that say if we have a um, uh, let me let me check this in here actually. So this might be easier if I open one to see so you can see the uh, the contents of one of these archives. So basically, the key one is this JSON file because we load all of this in memory. So the size of this will represent probably what we're going to use uh, the memory that we're going to use. So uh, there are issues that I will link later to to fix this this problem. Uh, there are a few things we can do basically, but it's not patched or anything. Um, so it corresponds to the size of these, maybe a bit more because we are creating also some, um, in the case of the input, we're creating 
some uh, active record uh, models and things, but uh, pretty much about the size of the JSON is what we can um, uh, we can guess. Um, how can we or a customer find the amount of memory required by the instance for the import export of a project? So this is, I mean, it's difficult to figure out, but uh, the project JSON is a good approximation because this is the the um, the key issue in performance is related to this JSON and. You can check the size of it, and then you can pretty much guess that we are at least going to load the whole JSON in memory. Uh, so it's going to use that, um, uh, plus a bit more. Uh, so you can predict that if you have like um, um, one gig JSON, then it will be at least one gig. And obviously, uh, then the sidekick process will just have at least 500 megs that is just Rails loading. Um, then the input itself or the export itself may use a bit more memory. So that would be about two gigs maybe. Um, plus, um, well, uh, the, the, the RSS is not perfect either. It's not difficult to, to measure the memory, but it's a good approximation anyway. Uh, but there's more things going on because we are sharing this process with other threads that may use a bit more memory. Um, so, it's a bit of a difficult guess, but I would say the, the JSON file is key to know. Um, hope that answers the question. Um, so the input jobs, the input job that does that again, it loads the um, JSON in memory. Then we do batch here, and this is quite important because if we didn't do this, then it would use way more memory because we, um, we do load, say, a bunch of issues, comments, and then we commit to the database and we free the memory as in we get rid of those objects and then we let um, the, um, the garbage collector do its thing, which worked quite, quite well. Uh, we didn't have to, I mean, we don't have to call it or anything. It's just, uh, it gets freed after a while, uh, but this is still not enough. Uh, we talk about, about this a bit more. Um, so slow JSON is one of the key problems, loading and dumping, um, especially when you think about millions of builds and um, message requests. And sometimes we have to touch the um, repository as well. Think about message requests, we may have to do some, some action per message request, such as, especially on forks. Uh, because we don't have the full project, we have to go to and check the um, the share of um, of the message request, um, as in where it points to and things like that, and then create like a fake um, ref for it. Um, but I, I, I won't go into much detail. But um, it could take a while to load all the active record. Um, um, models and this is this was causing the high memory um so one of the things here we can do is split the worker we do this already for the github inputs which improved quite a lot um, i remember for the uh, kubernetes import i think we we scheduled it and it took like i don't know at least three months to get imported so that that was that was crazy, but that was much faster after we split the worker. Um, so we we can split this into different uh, threads, well, processes really. And um, then also, Stan made um, a few good points about what's causing this, uh, linked to this issue here. Um, basically, some of the, when we use, we use active record to JSON, which means that um, because it doesn't know how this, um, what we're going to do with each model, then it doesn't it doesn't do anything clear. But we, you know, we may uh, call unnecessarily um, unnecessarily selects to the database that we could have bats and things like that. And uh, there's a few more things into it. Um, some of the things that. Um, we talk about on those issues, uh, as I mentioned, splitting these, 
uh, but the export, which is everything done in one go at the moment. Um, optimized SQL, so Active Record is doing a lot of things and it's, not, it's definitely not calling single, it's, definitely, it's calling single instance per, per model. So uh, well, we could batch those as well. Uh, we could batch the reading and writing to disk. We don't, we don't, do, we don't do this at all. Uh, move away from some Active Record callbacks would be great because uh, then it means that we could practically just insert into the debate database, like if it was a CSV import. Uh, but it's a bit difficult because sometimes we do need those callbacks. Um, DB commit, this is another issue. Uh, so for each batch, depending on when we commit to the database, this is related to um, active record transactions. Uh, so basically, um, when you uh, when we import something, we we sort of batch a few records, a few insets into the database. Um, then after each batch, we commit into the database because if we don't do, then all of that will be in memory and it, it will it will use a lot of memory basically. Uh, the problem with this is that it will get slower. So the more often we commit, the slower it gets. Um, so that's why I said a sweet spot there is, is quite useful. Um, we tried, we, I did try a few other tools such as OJ, but it doesn't help. I mean, tested this with um, a few, I don't know, I think it was like a four gig input and it did help, but just a few seconds, which, and, and the memory was exactly the same because it does use active record behind the scenes. This is promising this uh, fast JSON API, I think Stan mentioned in the issue as well. That may help. Um, then, well, there's a few, a few links there. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to dig, if you're interested in, in, in digging a bit more into this. Um, there's a few open issues and suggestions there. Um, at the moment, uh, this is being ongoing. We haven't scheduled this, but I think it would be useful. Uh, this one thing that we do now for customers, which is in the infra tracker, we have these foreground imports. So if we want to import a big project for customers, we do this in the uh, foreground using uh, a template. So these will these are basically avoids these sidekick issues, and it will use a bit more memory, but it will do the job basically. Um, so. Any questions? Okay, move on to security. Um, so the, the thing with the import export is that it's about three years old now, um, about what I've been in the company. <laughs> we really, haven't touched it that much. It's pretty much the same as what it was. So that is why performance now, because we keep adding things to it, um, um, got really slow. Then we should also perform a code audit, uh, code audit because we, we keep encountering a few security issues, especially lately, and we haven't really did much into it. Um, there's this issue there. Um, to, to do this, um, I think, and I mentioned this, that uh, we should prioritize that uh, to help with the uh, security aspect. Uh, there's a few more things in terms of security that we do. Uh, I mentioned earlier the attribute cleaner. This removes any anything that ends with ID unless uh, there are some references that we don't really use, but we change the IDs as in we, um, we need them for mapping basically. So when ID is one, we map it to ID black and things like that. But um, there's a few other prohibited keys that, um, such as token and things like that, that we may, um, so the attribute cleaner may, may just ignore basically. Uh, the other things is that we have a few specs that um, check for, for instance, for the addition of new columns. So um, this happens quite frequently when we add new things to anything related to a project or anything that hands 
in the uh, tree. tree. Um, we this this automatically detects uh, that there's a new uh, there's a change in a model that added a new column and it makes you think about it and say, hey, do you think this is safe to export or not? And it tells you uh, what to do. Similarly, we have the same for new models. Um, so we had a new model that hangs from project then this spec will fail and will let you know that you have to decide whether it's a good idea or not to export it. Um, there's a few more things such as detecting encrypt all sensitive columns. Um, so this is practically the same as the other specs. Uh, we have a safe list. Um, uh, so words like pass, password, token, and things like that. Um, anything um, that is a bit suspicious, then we will more and this spec will fail and we let you um, confirm whether that should be exported or not. Um, any questions? Okay, I drink a bit of water. So, next slide is versioning. Um, this is probably quite a frequent question I've seen um, from engineers, uh, which is basically um, when do we need to bump this version up? And the way the way the versioning works uh, with the import export, it doesn't follow a proper server um, thing. Um, so the version is basically, if we increase this number, then it will mean that it won't be compatible. And this is because we keep changing it. So for, for a specific release, we, we add quite a few changes that do not require um, a version bump, as in they won't break the import export. And if we were to add a new, increase this number per, um, per change that is not it doesn't break anything then um yeah it would be probably maybe 10 times every time we release a new gitlab version because we keep adding new things um so it's a bit of a pain for the customers because obviously when every time we bump the version up the customers may find that they couldn't import uh, an archive from from these um, old instances into the new one. So we try to limit this as much as possible. Um, which leads to the next question: uh, When do we need to bump the version up? Um, mainly when we rename a model or column, or we have format modifications that make it completely compatible, um, or the structure of the file itself. Say. You won't see it here, but we may have like an uploads folder where we keep these things in there. If we rename that folder or we change the structure of this file, it will break. And uh, that doesn't happen often. And um, what normally happens is renaming. Um, sometimes removing a column, um, although most of the times adding a new column or a model uh, doesn't imply any version bump because the import will ignore this anyway. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't complain. Um, so we can uh, we can do these things without needing to to change the version. Um, one thing when we change the version is that the integration specs that contain one of them contains a file like this and contains the version. Um, those will fail because we we bump in the version and it will moan about the. Um, the new version. There's a there's a reg task that basically um, bumps the version on that um, spec file for us. Um, but it's quite easy on, on Max, as you can see. <laughs> um, renaming is one of the main problems we have, um, especially when we because we run an uh, RC at GitLab.com, and most of our customers or users they don't. Um, it's a bit of a problem and 
this has changed recently and we try to now support at least one further version so we don't have this problem um, so basically now we can use this um, this service here that um, for one for one version say 11.6 we make it compatible and in this example we renamed uh, pipelines to CI pipelines. Um, so for 11.6, exports from 11.6 will work on all the instances because it will get exported as pipelines as well. Um, while in 11.7, we will expect this to be to be removed. Um, and this um, this is great for customers because then. Once we deploy an RC and GitLab.com, um, most of the exports that they have, it, it won't work if we bump the version up. But with this change, uh, hopefully it will, it will help. Um, so, yeah. Um, any questions? Um, okay, Luke is asking, what was the reason for not using a standard server? Because it can happen a number of times each release. Yes. Um, because there are compatible changes um, all the time. We, we keep adding um, not only motors, but columns and changing stuff uh, very frequent, then we could do it, but I think it's a waste of time. It's not very useful, really. And, and sometimes you don't know that you're actually modifying the import-export because, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very dynamic. And if you add a column or things like that, you're actually changing it, but you're not aware because it wouldn't complain. It would just ignore it. Um, so that is the main reason. And to be honest, the, this is really useful mainly for um, compatibility reasons, uh, because then you can always check really the GitLab version and there's this mapping and version history in the, uh, in the import export document, which is quite useful as well. Um, okay. Um, let's go to the next slide, which is um, basically a quick dive into the code. Um, the probably most important thing about the import export is that, and this is used by customers quite a lot, the, there is this configuration file, import export YAML, and in here we can specify what we actually export or import in an instance. Um, so everything hangs from this project tree and then we say we want to spot labels milestones events issues blah 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 and there's quite a few things in there um as you can see here we export um quite a few models all of these are models that we export uh, pipelines nodes blah 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 um, and sometimes customers may not be interested in exporting certain things. Um, the only issues with that with this is that they do need to reset the instance after a change here. Um, but um, yeah, there's another thing about this file that we can um, say what attributes we want to include and which ones we don't want to include. So uh, we can exclude certain attributes. This is quite useful for security purposes as well. Uh, we can ignore tokens and things like that. Uh, there's this method section as well um, in here. And this is, we don't use it very often, but sometimes we may want to export certain things that uh, may not have like a relation or we may want to ignore the relation itself and do something um, to that model. Uh, and that's the case for a few things like the uh, this UTF-8 diff that I think, um, well, this has been a few years, but I think there was an issue uh, when it's not UTF-8 and the JSON, it wouldn't work properly. So we changed this to use this and export the uh, UTF version. Uh, this is, uh, you can see there's a few types there. This is because it's a reserve keyword for race and for some reason, just doesn't export the type unless you specify. Um, next, 
is the input status. We, we talked about this earlier. Uh, this is in general the same for, for all inputs. Uh, um, they, they change from non to schedule when um, we schedule the, um, the job in Sidekick. Uh, once the job gets uh, picked by Sidekick, then it changes to started. And then it did, a, it did a change to finish it or failed. Um, and what happens in the import export after the, the job gets um, picked by Sidekick? It basically, it calls this importer class um, that um, does a few things like extract the file from um, the uploader. So we keep all these. Um, uh, we keep we keep both import and export in these uh, file uploaders, which actually has its own class as well here. Uh, but it's basically a, a file uploader. Um, this means that we can keep them in um, object storage if we configure it like that. So this basically this import file extracts that file and. Then the next thing we do is check the version to see if it's compatible or not. Then we call a few restorers that basically what they do is just um, either extract the repo and extract all, everything to do with the database models, um, uploads, LFS, um, yeah, and a few other things. Um, and obviously we we log any errors and we always clean up after, after we are done. Um, there's a few places that this can go wrong, such as when we, um, we did sidekick memory killer, for instance. So sometimes we have a few problems there, but um, um, yeah, the, um, the exporter is practically the same. Uh, we just um, we just basically uh, call a few services that uh, do the opposite. Uh, they just save the version, save the avatars, save all the JSON uploads, repository, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, after that, we notify the success and send an email. Uh, we also send, uh, we clean up and send an, uh, an email as well with the error if something happened there. Um, yeah, this is pretty much, pretty much it. Um, any, any other questions? Um, I think this is the practically the last slide. So uh, anything related to, uh, to any other slide as well. Um, okay, I, I listed a, um, a few links in the end as well. Um, there's a few things that we didn't cover, such as the um, admin documentation, which covers the great tasks, um, the API, um, um, and then the, um, the link to the presentation will be here, although it's not a presentation per se, as I mentioned, it's a marked out document. And I'm hoping I will I will submit a message request to add this to the um, to the root of the um, import export um, namespace, which is around here. So uh, I think this would be useful for developers to check. Uh, so we have like a readme there uh, with all all of this information. Um, okay. And wait a few seconds. Okay, I will give you back uh, 15 minutes then. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, definitely, if you have any other questions, feel free to join the, uh, the Manus channel and, and ask there. Uh, thanks a lot.